Welcome to the Inspire to Invest podcast, where we're sharing stories from real estate investors and how investing has changed their lives. This episode of Inspire to Invest has been brought to you by the Canadian Real Estate Women Association, also known as CRUA. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Inspire to Invest podcast. I have Dan Plowman here with me today, and he's been the number one realtor in Durham region for the past several years, but he had humble beginnings starting with the owning of an HVAC company. He sold this business to transition into real estate, opening up his own brokerage and coaching company, and he's on a personal mission to share everything that he's learned over the past three decades in real estate. His brokerage has sold more than $2 billion in real estate, so just about a home every day of the year. And naturally, he's owned many investment properties as well. And one of his goals is also helping his clients get into real estate investing. So thank you so much for being here, Dan. How are you? I'm well. Thank you for having me. Great. So obviously, you've had quite the journey over the last three decades. So maybe you can take us back. You were in HVAC. You had this business that you started. What was the catalyst that made you move over into real estate? Great question. Uh, I did work uh, in the HVAC business and I was kind of bored into it because that's what our family did. So growing yeah, up, yeah. my dad was, you know, doing heating and air conditioning. Then he went into sales and my brother became a mechanic and then I became a mechanic. And, and that's kind of the path I just fell into. Yeah. What I learned as I grew a, a heating and air conditioning company was a, I, I knew I wanted to work alone. I wanted to do my own thing, yeah. uh, my own business. I was very lucky at 18 to start my own business, cleaning furnaces. And yeah. But you had to have a license. You had to have a gas first license. I got my gas first license. I did that. Uh, my business took off pretty fast. Um, it grew to become, you know, installing furnaces and then air conditioners. And But what I realized between the age of 19, 20 to about 24, 25 was I didn't mind working 60, 70 hour work weeks. I knew I didn't want to do it the rest of my life, but I did love the sales part of it. So when I went out at night and did the sales, because no business has any right at being in business without sales, right? You have to have yeah. the sales. Everything's driven by sales. So I would you know, be swinging the wrenches during the day, but at night I'd go do the sales. So what I realized by the age of 24 and was honest about and was able to finally say, it, I really like sales. Um, more than even swinging the wrench, you know? So, and my brother was always a better mechanic than me. He was one of the guys that worked for the company now. And I built yeah. it up to like 20 plus people. So it was a good company. It was a viable company, sold it to him, went into real estate. That's why I went into real estate because of the sales side of it. And it actually was funny the way it happened. I was complaining about having done a real estate transaction, the first place I'd ever bought because at 25, I could finally afford to buy a vacant piece of land for $12,000 out in Peterborough. Wow. I, was in New York at the time. I thought, well, eventually maybe I'll build a house there because I can't afford to do anything here. North York was stupid money for, for certainly a 25 year old kid, yeah. uh, you know, getting by with uh, three little kids at the time. And I thought, well, this is great. At least I bought something. But I remember doing this transaction with this realtor that I never met, had to go down to Staples to, to sign the facts back and forth and spoke to him on the phone for maybe 20 minutes to realize on $12,000 transaction, he'd made 10% on the transaction, which was common back then on, you know, yeah. vacant properties or rural properties. And I said, I remember saying to him, so I have to pay you 10%? And he said, no, 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 it's paid by the seller. No, you don't have to pay me anything. You just asked me what I made. I said, oh, yeah. okay, gotcha, thanks, bye. And that was that. And it bothered me for weeks after. That gave me 1200 bucks. I hardly spoke to the guy. This is yeah. crazy. I was like, I worked like a dog to make a thousand bucks in a week. And I'm going back, you know, 35 yeah. years ago. Right. And he says, uh, and then I said to to someone at the time, I think it was my brother. And I, was, I kept saying to him, and he said, well, just why don't you just go to real estate then? And I just, ding. I said, the yeah. like, oh, right? And I remember thinking to myself, maybe I should do that. So I checked it out. I went to school and I did it. And, and then I just kind of, I'm going to do this full time, sold it to my brother and never looked back. I yeah. never, I started in the real estate business in 19, November of 89. And my broker at the time said, the day you start is the day the market crashed. <laughs> <laughs> That's really yeah. nice. That, that burden on my shoulder is really nice for all of the country. Um, and, and I remember thinking, okay, well, this is going to be tough. 24, 2,500 realtors on the Durham Region Real Estate Board have not merged with Toronto Board yet. Yeah. And within less than three years, I think it was 30 months, they had cut to half about half mm -hmm. of them walked out of the business and people were handing their key consumers were handing their keys back to the banks quick claims they were just power sales and when was this like 1987 then that was 1990 1989 yeah. i started so that was 1990 and interest rates 16 18 yeah. percent 1990 91 92 was the first three years in the business by 1991 which was my, was my second year in the business i made 
Uh, first year in the business, I made rookie of the year for the company, over 100 agents, which was the, one of the biggest offices in Durham. Yeah. And by 92, I was uh, number number two in the office for realtors. Yeah. Um, I was in the top 2% for all of Remax. Um, and what would you say you were doing differently that made you so successful compared to other people? Work ethic. Point? Work ethic. I came from 60, 70 hour work weeks in an HVAC company where I was up at 6 a.m. and wasn't home quite often before 8 p.m. Yeah. Uh, and I was genuinely working all the time. Yeah. Um, so when I came into real estate, because I mean, let's be honest, I was attracted to real estate because I saw the nicest cars, the nicest jewelry and people driving around with smiley faces all the time. Yeah. I mean, little did I know I was coming into a business where these people were going to put their cars repoed and be pawning their jewelry. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. But, and I'm not exaggerating really. I'm not. Okay. All these people lost their shirts. Yeah. I came into a business where I watched brokers and owners of five and six different commercial properties literally lose everything in, yeah. in, in the early nineties when rates yeah. went so high, there was, you know, the refinance and they were, the money wasn't there. And there's some common denominators to today, but not quite as bad in my opinion. But yeah, yeah I, I think to answer your question, Question, uh, and I'm not skirting the question. I, I think I think it was the fact that I wasn't afraid to really push. Yeah. And work hard. Those first five years in the business, I pushed. I worked 75, 80 hour work weeks. Uh, people were doing one open house on the weekends. I would do four, two on a Saturday, two on a Sunday. I would do one on a Thursday on a busy street. I'd pick up from somebody else in the office that was had a, 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 a listing that was on a busy street, and I would just meet people. Listen, here's the thing: it's kind of cool for our business and being realtors. Yeah. I talk to people they want to do um, door knocking. I talk to people they want to, you know, the odd one will want to prospect for an hour a day. They, yeah. Most people want to do something different. I want to do an open house. I want to do I want to do the Apple Festival and meet lots of people. I want to do the property show and, and set up a booth. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Yeah. Gonna, and all these ideas are great. I'm going to door knock. I'm going to door knock. Door knocking is going to be great. And they try these things, but they don't get the results. So they stop. Yeah. But what's interesting is the common denominator in all things that realtors want to try is this. They all basically are saying, I want to meet and talk to people, yeah. right? Yeah. You don't want to do the Apple Festival or the property show or the open house or the door knocking to not talk to people. You want to do it because you want to meet and talk to people. Yeah. So the common denominator, if that's it and that's the goal, please understand and know that that's something you can't stop doing. I don't care yeah. how you do it. Yeah. But you should be in this market coming into what we're going through and about to go through for the next couple of years, in my opinion, you've got to talk to and connect with 25 people a day. Yeah. Try 25 people a day. Just try it yeah. and watch. And I'm talking five days a week minimum. Yeah. 25 people. That's not easy. That means you've got to dial if you're going to just, you know, cold call. By cold call, I prefer warm calling. Do just list, just solds. Do yeah. something that's productive with a productive script. And we can help you without damn problem coaching. There's my plug. But if you do something every day and you think you're going to talk to 25 people just dialing 25 numbers, you're nuts. you got to dial about 250 to have 25 valuable conversations. That, that's yeah. about right. Okay. Yeah. So if you can do 25 a day for 90 days, not only will your business change, you will prosper like you never thought possible. Yeah. So I, 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 I kind of got off topic there, but I yeah, did. I know, I know. I find it interesting though, right? So, so just to your point, you were talking about obviously the flashy cars and like just the way that you know people want to present themselves. And I think the reality is that real estate's a very image oriented business, at least on that aspect to it. Um, and what I find really interesting is that you don't maybe a little bit more now, but you would see all these realtors that, you know, they have to work that hard to kind of maintain that image, to maintain that lifestyle. And you see a lot of them that retire and then they actually can't afford retirement. They go back to working because they haven't invested their money. They haven't invested in real estate. So how did you then go from, you know, you're obviously this top producer, but what drove you then to start investing as well, to just see the value in, in building that long-term wealth and equity? Well, I've, I've sure investing has been a part of my portfolio for sure. Well, I know we're going to talk about that. And that's that's the, the driver behind this, a little bit of this podcast, right? So I do know that I've made mistakes too. And I'll talk to you about those. I uh, One of the biggest mistakes I made in investing early on was uh, I took a partner. So be careful if you're going to pick a partner when you're investing in real estate because 
uh, the partner that I happened to take on, I won't use any names, it doesn't matter. We had built about 50, 55 units together. And by that, I mean actual units that were rentable. So some were triplexes, some were fourplexes, some were duplexes, yeah. just over 50 units. So we had a pretty good portfolio going, you know, and uh, the goal was to buy and hold, buy and hold, buy and hold, uh, put yeah. enough down, leverage against the property, buy another one. And yeah. you know the game, right? And, and tenant them, positive cash flow, or at least cover themselves, hold yeah. it, worry about it, walk away from it, the tenant pay it off, right? So that that's the game. The problem was um, my partner fell in love with someone else who had a different vision for their portfolio, who wanted the properties all sold so they could buy the big house on the hill. Hmm. So we were, we sold them. I should have bought some of them out. I said, okay, well, we'll sell them. That's fine. I did, I did take some monies and buy some others on my own with yeah. my wife. Um, so be careful when you pick a partner is where I was going with that. Be careful, you know, if you do. Um, uh, I prefer your partner. If you're going to go into business, make sure it's the same bank account you share your partner yeah. literally well, you should technically be opening it up a new corporation with them right i actually just sure. wrote a blog on joint venture <laughs> uh, partnerships yeah. and the questions that you should ask so it does 100%. cover off some of those things just in terms of having the same goals what your exit strategy is what the plan is having the same corporation bank account <laughs> all those good things the, the, um, the problem even if two officers are officers in a corporation if one person's plans change you're a victim of that regardless yeah, of whether you're corporate or not yeah. so just be I, careful. so just to, to your point i had my own business for 18 years and my business partner and the founder left four years in so you can imagine like i was like what yeah. <laughs> and it was a week after i bought my first house so i was like what's gonna happen you what's know she happening? was very much the face of the business she drove the sales i was more operations and on the back end so i was a little bit nervous obviously going into that because I had to assume her role and and kind of shoulder things while she was off so I understand I never dreamed going into partnership with her that she would be the one to leave but things happens, change right things life, change. life happens so yeah it's not good or bad or right or wrong it is what it is right yeah. so uh, fast forward a little bit um I realized I didn't want to uh, stay in the business of multiple tenants yeah. That was me. So I did maintain some investments with some individual homes where it was just one tenant for that home and had enough down that it was feasible to do that. So I have some investments now. I have, yeah. I have a condo in Yorkville and I have the cottage and the house. But mm -hmm. I have maintained my uh, investments. The mistake I feel that I made was at a younger age when I had the multiple properties. I wished I'd kept more of them. I wished I'd instilled more of a habit to buy one every 24 months yeah. with a healthy goal. Um, I'm 33 years in the business now. Um, you know, that, that would have been about 16, you know, 17 properties. Yeah. Um, right. And because well, you could have just gone into multifamily. <laughs> right. But yeah, but here's what's cool. Here's what's cool about buying anything in real estate, any investment. Yeah. Um, it, you know, you you make you push yourself to get the down payment to the point where the rent will carry it. Mm -hmm. The balance over 17 years, if you, you know, or 25 years, or however you am it, yeah. um, is paid for by somebody else. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, from all the real estate investors that I speak to, I think one thing that I, you know, I wish I had done sooner was going to multifamily, right? And there could be ways that you can just raise investor money and, you know, you're not even using your own money, but you own 50% equity and possibly an apartment right. building. And there are all these strategies that people can implement right. that, you know, you're not personally guaranteeing it. You may not use your own money and there's so much that you can do. So I think really it's just taking the risk, taking the chance and starting to build your equity. And it may start in one capacity and shift over, but you have to do what's going to work for you in the long run. Correct. That's right. And, and, and things change for people like I sound, but yeah, yeah that's uh, so my, my, my idea of the ideal investment for me personally, now I'm almost 60 years old in my late fifties is I, I don't want multifamily now. I just yeah. don't. Um, but I wish I'd had more, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but now I'm happy to have individual units where people, you know, just one tenant and, and that's, yeah. well, I'm okay with that. Yeah. But like I said earlier on, I wish I I I'd been more aggressive. Um, we did really really well to get to over fifty units. I think that is yeah. pretty aggressive. But I wish I'd been more aggressive on my own, is what I'm saying. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Uh, now, when you look back at your career, so like you said, it spans thirty three years. What would you think is your you know something that you're most proud of? 
I, I think uh, for me, um, being able to learn how to leverage people, technology, and, and money to the point where, as an individual on my own, I, I got to you know selling sixty three homes one year. That was a big deal. Like that's a lot of homes on, in one year. Actually, to the point where I was uh, doing a disservice to clients because I was starting to drop balls because you know as a realtor we wear many hats. Yeah. But to be able to dissect at that sector of my life and realize I got to go back to about 35, 40 deals, which is what I, that's the sweet spot when I was running and keeping everybody happy and doing everything yeah. properly and, and being a pretty good uh, service to everything that was required with all the hats I had to wear. Yeah. I think being able to dissect when I was at that crossroads or sector of my life and realize I either go backwards and you know, adjust my lifestyle to that, or I go forward, but learn how to leverage a business now where I can have yeah. better people to wear the hats that are more profile more uh, much better for for doing those positions. So yeah. being able to tear that down, identify that it was a business opportunity in our industry to develop a team when, when teams were not a thing, yeah. when brokers were saying, oh, this team thing will last, it's not going to work. And yeah. you know, by the way, 80, more than 80% of our deals now on the Toronto board of, you know, for 65,000 realtors are done by teams in one form or another. So yeah. teams are a viable thing they took up, but be, to be able to identify early on that there's an opportunity here and then yeah. to build out the job descriptions, leverage the people, technology and marketing and train phenomenal realtors on the team and leverage opportunities that come their way so that they can work on a platform Platform that allows them to prosper more than traditional brokerages or real estate offers. I think that to me is pretty cool. When I watch people come into my business uh, in the first 12 months, my goal is to get them to six figures with no expenses as quickly as no expenses as quickly as possible yeah. within 12 months. And yeah. then to teach them how to get to 150, teach them how to get to 200, 250, 300. Okay, buy yeah. a cottage now, buy an investment product. When I watch people do that that have been on my team for some 12, 15, 17 years, that's exciting to me. Yeah. So I think that's probably the, the, the brokerage that I built. And then, of course, the byproduct of that is, is now we take those systems that we use internally and we we use them in a coaching and training company. We help other yeah. people right across Canada and North America, some clients as far south as Texas. So yeah. we're grateful we're able to take what, what works for us that we do actively each and every day and yeah. give it to others turnkey as well. Yeah, no, I think that's huge because I think at the end of the day, you know, you go from being a sole proprietor to basically running a business, right? And you've got to understand how to grow and scale. What would you say are some of the biggest challenges that you experienced early on when you were starting to grow that team? Well, growing the team early on. Okay, so that uh, I was already, you know, eight, nine years into the business on my own. So when I started to to grow the team, some of the biggest challenges I think were my ego. Uh, I had a hard time sharing my clients with my new partners. Yeah. Um, I, I had to let go, you know, you know, the old saying one step backwards, two steps forward. Yeah. Well, sometimes one step backwards means I give you two clients and I only keep one, but yeah. you make more money and I make less for a little while. But then when I have three or four of you doing that, now you're all getting more business than me, but we're all yeah. prospering together. Yeah. It pays back in dividends, but you've got to learn as a team leader, as a leader in any industry, I believe you've got to learn that your direct success is secondary to what others and how you can help them get to where they need or want to go. Yeah. If you've got great people that want to work, you've got to elevate them. You Even at your own expense is what I'm trying to say. And yeah. when you genuinely give to someone else, knowing and they know that you genuinely want them to do well at any cost, including your own, uh, I believe there's a lot out there. There's a lot for all of us to take from. And uh, money's just a natural byproduct of doing the right things. And when yeah. I got my, when I got rid of the ego and really enjoyed and learned how to help other people, help other people elevate, yeah. um, it, we grew. The team grew. But that was the, one of the biggest things I needed to learn early on because I went through a few people arguing yeah. and fighting over stupid little things yeah. that really didn't matter. Yeah. And when I started to realize, hey, this is not right. I, I need to help these people prosper here more than that of which traditional real estate you know yeah allows. And it, it's hard to to just to, to give people the breathing room to make the mistakes right like I think that was one challenge that I had as an entrepreneur that you know I had these client relationships and so now you're at the point where you're delegating and it was hard to see people stumble and make mistakes because it felt like you know it's your reputation on the line it could possibly cost you that relationship with that client but it's all part of growing like you're not going to be able to grow if you can't you know, pull back on the reins a little bit, right? So right. I think it's all just part of growing as a business owner, right? So That's with that right. said, we're just going to take a really brief break for a word from our sponsors and we'll be right back. 
The Canadian Real Estate Women Association, also known as CRUA, is a national not-for-profit association of female professionals working and investing in Canadian real estate. They believe that women have no limits in the real estate world. They're looking to connect with leaders in the industry who will share the strategies that they use in real estate along with exclusive details of their life experience, which are important for consistent personal and professional growth and happiness. To learn more, go to crua.ca. Thanks again for following along with this episode of Inspired to Invest. In addition to real estate, investing, and running my own brand experience agency for 18 years, I also published a book called The Accidental Entrepreneur in October of 2021. This is my story, and it chronicles how I turned tragedy into triumph to embrace my destiny in entrepreneurship. If you're interested in picking up a copy, you can find the link at serenahomesrealtor.com, and you can also find my link tree with all of the retailers in the details below. Thanks again for your support. Inspired to Invest is proud to support the Beyond Success program. In today's complex world, it's absolutely crucial for our youth to learn how to take charge of their financial future. We believe that every young person deserves access to accurate, practical financial information. Designed to bridge the gap, the Beyond Success program leverages a comprehensive educational bootcamp to equip young minds with essential financial literacy skills. At Beyond Success, it's not just about teaching financial literacy, it's also about fostering a foundation for a prosperous and empowered future. Join us, together we can build a brighter financial future for the next generations. Join us. Together we can build a brighter financial future for the next generations. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Inspired to Invest podcast. I have Dan Plowman here today. He is the number one realtor in Durham region and he's sharing some of his experiences not only as a realtor, but also as a real estate investor. So just before the break, we were talking about some of those challenges that you experienced growing your team and some of the successes as well. What's the craziest thing that you would say that you've experienced so far, whether it's as an investor or as a realtor? The craziest thing? Oh my. <laughs> um, well, that's a big question. Um, well, I've had a lot of crazy things happen. I, I, I'm not sure how to answer that. The crazy, <laughs> cra- crazy, you mean like crazy fun, crazy stupid? I mean, I, I've only been a realtor for not that long and I've already had my fair share of crazy things. So I can imagine in 30 plus years that you've had a few. Is there anything that jumps out that you're like, oh? Well, you say jumps out. So I think of a story when I had a partner early on, we worked together as a team, what we thought was a team back in 1991, 92. And it was basically just two people sharing the same name on a card. But you know, it was great because that person had been in the business already for 12 years. So I was able to take on a lot of knowledge and experience and, and, and you know, how to do vendor take backs when financing was an issue and creative, doing creative deals, I'll say that. Yeah. Um, but I remember she'd walked into a place to show it and uh, uh, she'd opened a door that I guess wasn't supposed to be open, but we didn't know we were inside <laughs> the house and uh, it was dark and it was hot. Uh, oh, she went in and she went in the door and closed behind her because it had a spring on the door that closed the door, which was odd. Couldn't find the light and a monkey had jumped on her. Oh no. <laughs> this was, this was a, a room that had been at a jungle environment, including the oh, heat. My God. And uh, that was kind of crazy. Um, I've had some other crazy okay. things happen. Yeah. I, I was at an open house once where, uh, I fell asleep to wake the client waking me up on their couch. So oh, no. <laughs> working harder, hardly working. Yeah. That's I was doing a lot of open houses. I'll tell you one more story that happened that's more specific to our industry and my enthusiasm. I remember early in the business when I talked to realtors and I would ask them, what do you do? How do you make money? Because that was I needed to make money. I wanted yeah, to make yeah. And I, I noticed a common denominator. They were the good realtors were doing an open house one every weekend. Yeah. So I thought, well, what if I do two? What if I do Saturday and Sunday? And then I got to the point, what if I do four? Two yeah. on a Saturday, two on a Sunday. So that became my life, was doing four open houses every weekend. And I was enthusiastic. And I'd say, how many signs do you put out? They well, we put one in front of the house and a couple others out. So three or four signs, five or six, whatever. So I thought, okay, I'm, I sold my car. I got a van so I could get 10 oh. signs. And then I had a <laughs> dozen signs. Well, the more signs I put out, I'll do better. So this one particular Monday after doing open houses, um, my broker comes to my office and we have French doors, you could see through them. And I'm sitting at my desk and I see my broker with two police officers standing. Oh. So you knock on the door, 
And they come in and the cop steps by the broker and says, are you Dan Plowman? I'm like, yeah. And he says, yeah, you did an open house in Bowmanville on the weekend. Uh, Mr. Plowman, we're here to let you know you can't put open houses down the 401 ramps, open house signs down the 401 ramps. So I was so enthusiastic as a new realtor, I thought I'd put my signs all down the 401 ramps, you know, to, to come off the 401 and come up to my open house and come into the subdivision. I have 12, yes. 15 signs on every open yeah. house. And this was an enthusiasm, right? Yeah. And I looked at the officer. I said, I'm so sorry. I didn't know that. He says, yeah, we're here to warn you now, but we can find you for that. You cannot do that. Yeah. And off they went. So that was one of their things they had to do. It was on their list to, to make sure they went around and told Mr. Plum he couldn't do that. So the broker, yeah. my broker, after they left, Frank said to me, man, you're killing it. Keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> uh, well, let's just say it is strategic, but right? I can see from yeah. the police officer didn't quash it's dangerous. He, he didn't want to quash my enthusiasm, right? <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, do you think there's anything that stands out to you also as the best advice that you've ever received or something that you like to share with people that you think will help them early on in their careers? So I, th I think the best advice I'd give anybody new in the business uh, that's coming into real estate, is that what you're asking? Yeah, just the best advice that that you think is important to share? Leverage knowledge, leverage experience if you can. If you're going to come into this business and be, you know, because a lot of what happens, you know, in this industry is you're kind of thrown to the wolves. Good luck. Here's your office. Here's your bill every month. Or good luck. Here's your office. And here's your split every month. I hope you make it, you know, and that's, and I'm not making fun or light of brokers. I think brokers have come a long way with regards to helping with training and, and caring about their, their, their people. And that's not what I'm saying, but, if, if you can take and invest in the very best thing, which is yourself, leverage some knowledge, leverage point one, for example, we have a point one product for new people coming into the business that gives you, you know, scripts, it gives you uh, how to track, it gives you a CRM, contact relations management system, which gets you organized quickly. It gives you all the tools as a realtor so that you can leverage a hundred grand a year quickly. Yeah. Because most people that come into this business don't make it, right? And unfortunately, a lot of people, leave our business that should now there's some people that are in the business that should leave but that's another story uh, i'm joking but i'm not but i will say if you're able to invest in yourself with the right tools the right language and then the right habits so you have a if you can get to a schedule of eight or ten hour schedule every day of actual dollar productive activities yeah. and you keep doing it consistently you will make money in this business. You'll make it in this yeah. business. But yeah. the problem is most people come in and, and they do this. Well, what do I do now? What do I do? I should try this. I should try that. I should try yeah. this. I should try that. And they think they had a busy day being busy, but nothing was really specific to dollar productive activities. Yeah. And, and without understanding what that means, without understanding how to do that, you'll fail. That's yeah. the problem. So I think leverage, like again, Dan Palmer coaching point one, leverage, leverage something that's going to give you specifics that will get you on the path of a daily schedule that's productive. That would be my advice. Okay, awesome. Uh, now, obviously you've had such a robust career already. What's next for you? Um, I really, really enjoy it. I've had a lot of, having a lot of fun with my coaching side, with my coaches, as well as my sales team here and the marketing team, uh, helping people again, take and leverage and use what we do so that they can just use a turnkey. It's pretty cool to have a coaching and training company that isn't just set up based on, we want to help people, but it's yeah. based on here's what we do. And here's how many homes we sell. You can too, just use our system and plug them in turnkey. We actually practice what we preach, which is pretty yeah. powerful. That's my unique selling prop as a training company. So I think for me, what's next is to continue to help people to grow their business and, and launch their business as quickly as possible. Yeah. Point one products do that for you. What would you say is your financial freedom number? Well, what does that mean? A financial freedom number? I, I, I believe, I mean, you want 20 million in the bank or 20 million in assets or what well, do you Well, sometimes mean? people look at it as monthly cash flow, number of doors, like number of people helped. Like it, it means oh, different things to different people, you know, like, is there anything that you would say you're specifically striving towards that would make you feel financially free, whether that's in terms of return on time, return on investment? Well, for me personally, I don't, I don't need a lot of money anymore. So I think maybe I, I, I don't, don't need to sound arrogant here. I really genuinely enjoy uh, a residual aspect or uh, that, that has been already built and established from some, some businesses that I'm a part of. So I, I, I personally like the word residual more than I do, you know, two, two million, five million in the bank. Not that that's a bad thing either. I think both are great, 
but I really love residual. I think people are living longer. Yeah. I think you made a reference to this early when we started this this conversation, just you and I have ago. You talked about people that are coming back in the business because they're, you know, their lifestyle and they need more money. You know, yeah. residuals or cash flow is a powerful, powerful thing. So yeah. um I, I love still having my assets paid off by others and my, you know, my equity and other homes, don't get me wrong. Yeah. And I and I believe that you know, investing in in, in stocks and diversified all in all aspects is important as well. Yeah. Um, you know, I max out my RSPs every year and I have for many, many years. I do all of that stuff. So is there one magic number that's going to allow me financial freedom? I think I'm there personally. Yeah. Um, I think I'm pretty free. I genuinely do what I want to do every day. And I enjoy stuff like this. I enjoy yeah. talking to people about their business. I have two conversations with people on my team today to help them get back in, in gear with regards to and, and sync with regards to their dollar productive activities daily. We had a yeah. great meetings this morning to two of my team members. I'm grateful they come to me. Um, I'm grateful to help team leaders with their teams still to do those things. So the fact that I have that allows me to do the things I love without yeah. having to push to do the things maybe that I don't like so much, but I'd have to do because I need the money. So I'm grateful for that. Yeah, no, I think that's huge. And I guess the real question is, are you using self-directed RSPs to invest in real estate? <laughs> well, I did. I have. And you can through certain funds, like Olympia is one of them. You can do that. Nothing can be arm's length, as you know. Um, I have, yes. Uh, I found that the returns changed when rates dropped as low as they did. And I went back to some stocks. I'm now moving some other monies and doing some more of that in second mortgage. When you say invest in real estate, I'm not I sure. I was just being tongue in cheek because it's a real estate investing fund. Oh, no, so you can. You to can. See where you're yeah. directing those investments. There's, there's good money in holding second mortgages. Be careful with your loan value ratios. Um, know that 80-20 is better than that because you have yeah. you know legals that allow you to protect 6% commission too. So, yeah. you know, you yeah, I mean, just be careful with your loan to values when the market is a market's declining. If you're going to invest in second mortgage, it's good money in second mortgage. Yeah. Um, so yes, I have, I have, and I do, I think I have a couple of seconds out still, but not a lot. I had yeah. quite a few out before yeah. COVID and when rates, I'm going back seven, eight years ago, I had quite a few out. Um, yeah. But I moved them back into the stock market, a lot of them. And now I'll, I'm slowly moving stuff back again the other way. So, yeah, but I there's, think there's a lot of things now, like a lot of real estate investors have launched mutual fund trusts so that they can accept registered funds. So I found that, you know, I think they just, there's a number of reasons why people move towards that. I think they want to be very careful when it comes to securities, working with exempt market dealers, but it also opens up your investor pool to be able to accept registered funds. So it's becoming very, very popular, at least in the communities that I move in. So I was just curious to see what your strategy was. Um, now in closing, is there any quote that motivates you most that you want to share with the, anyone watching right now? I love quotes and I love that you asked me that question. I'll share a quote with you that I just heard recently and it's this. You gotta bear with me because I gotta find it. Oh my, I, I'm having a hard time finding it. And I have a <laughs> great quote for you. And it's uh it's with regards to making sure you're able. Oh, there it is. I do have it. The magic you're looking for is in the work you are avoiding. Yeah. That's it. I love that quote. And, and if I were to say it in, in a little more in depth, stop complaining about the results you didn't get from the work you didn't put in. The only way to become more successful than most people is by doing the work that most people aren't willing to do. <laughs> it's just, it's awesome. I love that quote. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that makes perfect sense. Now for anyone that wants to get in touch with you to learn more about your brokerage or your coaching program, what's the best way for them to get in touch? Just Google Dan Plowman coaching, Dan Plowman training, and everything's there. I appreciate you. And thank you for having me. Great. And we'll include that in the show notes below as well. So for anyone that's watching, please make sure you like, comment, and subscribe so you don't miss out on future episodes. And of course, thank you for tuning in to Inspire to Invest. And remember, when you invest in yourself, the sky's the limit. Thank you again to the Canadian Real Estate Women Association for bringing you this episode of Inspired to Invest. The views represented on this podcast are for general information only and does not constitute investment or other professional advice or an offering of securities. The host and guests featured on Inspired to Invest make no representations as to the performance of any particular investment. Should you decide to make an investment, you are responsible for conducting your own review and analysis. It is recommended that you obtain independent legal, accounting, and tax advice from licensed professionals.
This episode of Inspire to Invest has been brought to you by the Canadian Real Estate Women Association, also known as CRUA.